I'm Susan Yost Vilgate, and I'm the Education Director at the Fresno Art Museum. And we are thrilled that Bonnie uh, has agreed to, to do this uh, open studio tour virtually. I just wanted to let you know that this is being recorded. We hope to have a recording available in a few weeks once it's been edited. Uh, we ask that everyone please keep their audio on mute. You will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end. And there, you can also take advantage of the chat if you would like, and you can ask questions via the chat. Uh, and we will read those first before we mm. open it up to all the participants to, to ask questions. And uh, that's pretty much it as far as the housekeeping stuff goes. And I am going to turn the, uh, the, the mic, so to speak, over to Sarah Vargas who is a curator at the curator at the Fresno Art Museum. And she also curated Bonnie's exhibition. So Sarah, the floor Hi, is yours. everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Susan said, my name is Sarah Vargas and I'm the curator at the Fresno Art Museum. And I'm really excited and proud to have worked with Bonnie on bringing her exhibition, Another Glorious Sierra Day to Fresno. And I hope soon that most of you will have an opportunity to see it in person. So we have a short video I wanna share with you. It is a walkthrough of the exhibition. It is installed in our lobby and concourse galleries at the museum. So let's go ahead and start the video. <laughs> All right. Another Glorious Sierra Day is an exhibition of narrative art by artist Bonnie Peterson, who uses embroidery to investigate environmental and social issues in the Sierra Nevada. Inspired by a variety of source materials such as scientific data and early explorers journals, Bonnie embroiders words and phrases on velvet and silk fabrics to create large narrative wall hangings, as well as a series of annotated topographic maps. And that image that you just saw and this one coming up are examples of the maps. Her projects examine geophysical climate issues from both a contemporary and a historical viewpoint. Also incorporated in some of the works are personal remembrances and experiences culled from Bonnie's travel journals. Now, Bonnie grew up in the Midwest and currently still lives there, but has been backpacking in the Sierra Nevada mountains since the 1980s. In 1997, she participated in an artist residency at Yosemite National Park and has continued to visit Yosemite and the surrounding areas ever since. These trips provide her with a chance for personal exploration into the impacts of contemporary society and provide a novel opportunity for a consideration of current events and ethical questions. Her selection of textiles and maps integrate the geographic features of the Sierras with 19th and 20th century exploration and contemporary wilderness encounters. Using rich fabrics and intricate stitching, her work provides a unique opportunity to create an interest in further research on the Sierra environment and geography. Another glorious Sierra day provides an original perspective on one of California's most iconic and beloved national parks. So there are 11 quilts and five maps included in the exhibition. You've seen some of them already. So I will just give you a little detail of the ones that are coming up now. So this is a quilt entitled Drought, and it's a great example of how she incorporates scientific data into her work. And I know Bonnie will be talking about this piece in more depth when she speaks, and it is embroidery on silk. Then coming up here, these are two of the annotated topographic maps. You can see there are images affixed to the maps. They are sometimes stitched on, and some of them are applied via heat transfer. This is one of the larger quilts that we have. It is Hetch Hetchy Blueprint. And as you can see, it is a rendering of the actual blueprint of the Hetch Hetchy project. It is embroidery on silk. 
and in the top right corner here, and also in the bottom corner, you see examples of her freehand lettering. And at the end of her talk, we have a short video that shows how she achieves that technique. So over here on this wall is one of the smallest quilts in the exhibition. This one is Tanaya Lake. It is embroidery and heat transfers on satin, silk, and brocade. This piece is Glacier Survey, embroidery and heat transfers on silk. And there you see the photographs that are applied to the quilt starting in 1903 through the present day. This piece is Hetch Hetchy Valley, embroidery and heat transfers on silk, satin, and brocade. And then this will end our walk through here with the large quilt Muir Trail, which is embroidery and heat transfers and paint on silk, satin, and brocade. And it's an excellent example as we zoom in on the very intricate detail and elaborate stitch work that Bonnie does. And so that concludes our walkthrough. Um, I hope it was fun to get a little bit of a sample of what the exhibition itself looks like. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Bonnie and she can take us through her studio and her process. Okay, I'm going to share my video. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you everybody for tuning in today. I'm in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan right now. It's near the south shore of Lake Superior. Less than 100 miles as the crow flies to the north shore. Lake Superior provides about 200 inches of snowfall in a typical winter. So far, we've had 66 inches, and that has compacted down to about a foot on the ground. Right now, it's snowing, uh, and there is a forest out the back windows with groomed cross-country ski trails, and I just ski right out the back door every morning. There's a lot more light in the house in the winter because the leaves are gone and there's a ton of reflectivity coming off the snow coming up here. I moved up here from Chicago where I grew up as Sarah said and was introduced to the Sierra Nevada mountains when I was in my early twenties by a coworker who took me to climb Mount Whitney. We did the Mountaineers route I started making artwork about my hiking trips when I had an artist residency at Yosemite. A recurring theme in my work is the glacier measurements at Yosemite. Now I'm going to show you how I get started with a wall hanging using four examples from the show. Okay, this is how I organize long term projects and the velvet and brocade fabrics. The silk and velvet fabrics are the base materials for my work and text is the most important element. I'm just going to show you a basket. Some velvet fabrics. And I'm going to talk about drought. It's in a basket called climate. Handy music stand here, leftover from kids. So 
this is a page where I've kept the composition ideas for drought. Drought is 38 by 35 and it's all embroidery on silk. I started making climate graphs during a University of Wisconsin artist scientist project about 10 years ago. But drought is an example of working with a scientist and there was not a formally established artist scientist project. Here's a couple of the composition drawings. The big words are snow water equivalent. It's a common snowpack measurement. It's the amount of water contained in the snowpack. And you can think of it as the depth of water that would theoretically result if you melted the entire snowpack instantaneously. It's measured on April 1st all over the Sierra Mountains and it's a major foundation for California's water planning. Snow data is important to me for planning backpacking trips. A few years ago, I read the alarming news reports about California's 500 year drought. And I was curious about the calculations behind this news. I reached out to the professor and author of the journal article behind the statistics, Valerie Truitt at the University of Arizona Tree Ring Lab. The article was published in the journal Nature Climate Change in 2015. And she helped me untangle the methods and statistics behind using snow water equivalent data paired with tree wing science to explain the extreme nature of this drought. It has to do with climate proxies and that's the text along the bottom right here and A common example of a climate proxy is an ice core from Greenland or Antarctica. The air bubbles in the ice core are analyzed for carbon dioxide measurements. A climate proxy stands in for direct measurements to enable scientists to reconstruct the climatic conditions that prevailed during Earth's history. Here's a second example. This is called Glacier Survey. It's 40 by 46. I backpacked to the Lyle Glacier with a group of geologists, journalists, and other backpackers. It was a Yosemite Association trip in 2008, and it started at Tuolumne Meadows at the elevation of 8,600 feet. We learned about the methods used to measure Yosemite's glaciers every September. The Lyle and McClure glaciers are very close together, so we visited both. One reason why it's important to have annual measurements is that the Lyle Glacier melts into the Tuolumne River, which fills up Hetch Hetchy and supplies water to San Francisco. The text in this describes the glacier in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I found it in John Muir's and Israel Russell's journals. Israel Russell was a geologist who worked at Mono Lake in the 1880s. In these drawings, I was working out where to place the glacier's topple lines, the comparative glacier photos, and the text. And here's a picture of Greg Stock, the Yosemite geologist, measuring the depth of a hole in the glacier. Photos from the backpacking trip are on the back of that postcard, and they are images I produced for a Pachacacha lecture about my trip. 
Pacha Kacha is an evening of 10 lectures, generally held in a bar, where 20 slides are shown at a fixed rate of 20 seconds per slide. It's a very quick mini lecture. It lasts only six minutes and 40 seconds, and it's a lot of fun. There's a link to a YouTube video of that on my website. Okay, here's Mono Lake. Uh, this piece is 43 by 50. Mono Lake is an ancient saline lake located at the eastern edge of the Sierra. It's visible from space and it's home to a unique ecosystem of brine shrimp, birds, and world famous tufa towers. There's the tufa towers. Its tributary streams also supply water to LA, 350 miles to the south. And that's why people are measuring the level of Mono Lake. There's a lot of text in this one and most of it is from William Brewer's journal. William Brewer was a geologist and botanist. He took an 1860 to 1864 trek by foot, horseback, and boat, exploring California's topography, plants, and animals. His small team carried five foot barometers to calculate elevations and climbed all of California's highest peaks. Brewer recorded his findings, analysis, elevations, and amazing personal reflections in a massive diary that is still selling today called Up and Down California. It's almost 600 pages. And on the front cover, there's a funny review that says, like a trip in a time machine, full of adventure and discoveries. So here's one more example. This one is Valley of Domes. It's 43 by 45. I first saw this dome-filled valley near the end of a three-week trek on the Tahoe Yosemite Trail. It's 185 miles long, and it starts at Meeks Bay on Lake Tahoe and ends at Tuolumne Meadows. This extraordinary valley is in northern Yosemite between Benson Lake and Smedberg Lake. It's near the washboard section of the Pacific Crest Trail. And most of this text is from my own hiking journal. Now I'm going to adjust the camera so you can see some of the variety of threads I use. Okay, um, these are the threads I use for hand embroidery and free motion machine embroidery. I just move the fabric under the needle by hand. That means the feed dogs are down and out of the way. And uh, there's a video of that that Sarah referred to after this studio tour. Over on the white shelving next to the window are thick rayon threads, which I use to give a shiny effect. And here's some of those close up. And on these two, stands are a thick wool acrylic or wool cotton blend called Burmilana. And here's an example of that. 
I have an assortment of pearl cotton and some other threads that I only use for hand stitching. And then over on the wall are very thin threads that I use for making delicate printing um, by machine stitching and uh, kind of subtle sutures. And that's typically 40 or 50 weight cotton or polyester. Okay. Now I'm going to rotate this again. Mm. I pin fabrics right onto this wall. It's drywall covered with 24 feet of three quarter inch sheets of insulation material called Celotex. The Celotex is painted with a few coats of white wall paint and I can put pins right into the wall. I pin up the backing fabric, just a piece of regular thin cotton, then a piece of cotton flannel, and then the base, which in this case is silk du peony. Then I pin through all three layers and take the sandwich to a table for hand basting or I'll free motion baste it on my machine. I like to use the silk du peony as a background fabric it comes in a really huge variety of colors, hundreds. And it's kind of a rough nubby silk with one color going horizontally, which in this case is pink, and the other color vertically, in this case it's yellow. So it gives a lot of reflectivity under different light conditions and uh, reflects a lot of different colors, even though it's only pink and yellow. Also, it's good for making a subtle frame as with this permafrost. Sometimes I make something in units as with this permafrost yellow graph. The first graph I made was too dark I didn't like that and it was too small. So I just made another one and stitched it right onto the background. Here's an example of the unit from the Muir Trail piece. It's a piece of the Muir Trail map and I painted and embroidered it. And then I just sewed it onto the background. Okay. Oh, one more sample. This, this, I cut off the ends of the Hetch Hetchy map. And you can see I stitched right through all three layers. Uh, actually, it's this way through the Tuolumne River. And you can see the backing, which is just the really thin cotton and the cotton flannel center, and then the silk top. Okay, I'm going to rotate this again. Uh, now you can see out the front, that's the street. And it's still snowing like crazy out there. Okay, these are the tables I use for hand stitching or basting and for making the topo maps. And there's five maps in the show, as Sarah mentioned. Okay. Um, First, I'm just 
going to show you an example of the variety of silk dupioni. Now, take more time. This is an example of a hiking map before I embellished it. It's Mount Darwin Quadrangle. It has part of the Muir Trail going through it, through Evolution Basin. The maps are all standard seven and a half minute USGS topo maps used for navigation. When I first hiked the Muir Trail in 1982, there were no condensed trail maps or phone maps as there are now. And I carried many of these large USGS topo maps. Each of the framed maps in the show has information and history about the area on the map or handwriting for my journal as I traveled through the area. Here's an example of a map that is not framed yet. Um, the base of the map is a topo map called Escalante Utah Quadrangle. I've stitched on, well, let me show you the back first. You can see the back of the stitches. So I've stitched on patches of velvet, um, silk, maps, parts of other topo maps, and also a, I've ironed on direct transfers just right onto the map. Here's a part of Escalante Canyon and some of the plants around that canyon. And then there's a lot of text. And the text I wrote, I just wrote directly onto the map and also uh, transferred, ironed on some of the text with an iron. So here is an example. Of a framed map. And this map is near here. It's very unique because it has land in the center and Lake Superior's on the north end and the south end. And that's what I like to find when I'm picking out a map as something unique. And then you can see the uh, little patches that are stitched around it. I'm always looking for opportunities to work with artists and scientists. And this table has on it uh, a lot of articles that I've been collecting for my next project, which is permafrost. Um, when I started doing research on permafrost, I discovered it's a lot more complicated than I thought. One aspect of permafrost is permafrost distribution. It's where is the permafrost? And this is all the Northern Hemisphere, which is almost 25% covered by permafrost. Here is another interesting aspect called active layer thickness. And the active layer of the permafrost is the stuff on top of the permafrost that melts in the summer and refreezes 
in the winter. So uh, some of the things I did to this piece is I stitched into the velvet edge. Um, also, I outlined all the text so it was a little more visible. I used both the wool acrylic and the rayon threads. And then I also added printing, which is all free motion uh, with my sewing machine. Here is an example of some crazy quilt stitching in the edge. And I put that all over the edge. But I used a similar color, so it's kind of subtle. And one more example, this piece I stitched what's called a Kanta stitch. It's a stitch from India all over the edge. And then in the inner frame, I stitched teeny little stitches everywhere in there too. So just one more example. I got some of those out of this interesting book. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Sarah and Susan and Esther and everybody who works at the Fresno Art Museum. The show looks really great. And thank you everybody for coming to my studio today. Maybe I'll stop sharing. Uh, we have a, a little video of uh, Bonnie doing some machine stitching that I will attempt to play right now. I'm embroidering the word and using a 12 weight rayon on the top and a very thin cheap polyester thread on the bod bobbin. Also, I have the tension set so that it's lighter on the top so that uh, not as much of the bobbin thread will come through. Also because of the heavy weight of the rayon. The feed dogs are down, which means I can just move the needle anywhere uh, and, and write, you know, letters this way. I also have a stabilizer piece of tear away paper underneath, which helps uh, stabilize and uh, keep the machine sewing. Otherwise, uh, it, it would not work. Great, thank you. So I'm um, looking at the chat. Um, there are a couple of questions. Do you work on one piece at a time or several at once, Bonnie? I try to work on three at a time because I usually get to a place where I can't do anything else because I don't know what to do. Uh, and by that time, I have figured out what to do on piece number two. Um, or as with this permafrost, piece that I showed, it's rather large and I 
spent a long time in DC last year, so I didn't finish it. So it's nice to have smaller things too, which those uh, pieces I held up are all around 24 inches. So that's something I could take with me and do a little bit of work elsewhere. Thank you. Um, there's another one. Let's see. Oh, I'm going to have fun with this word. Can Bonnie discuss how she translate the, translates the concept of the Anthropocene, am I saying that right, into oh. her designs, colors, scales, etc.? Oh, I, I use that word. It's a word that's gaining more use as humans affect the climate. And it basically means human affected climate era instead of Holocene, which is the uh, era that we're in right now. It's, it's a geologic time era. And, and that was a standard CO2 graph for uh, maybe 400,000 years or some huge amount of time, which is one of the things that you can get when you measure the CO2 air bubbles in the uh, ice cores. Great, thank you. Now I, I learned a new word today. <laughs> uh, if anyone else has a question, you are welcome to unmute yourselves and go ahead and ask it. Bonnie? This is Kay Cummings, and I have a book that I've just read that I thought you would love. I'm going to put it up. It's David Attenborough's most recent book, A Life on Our Planet, a must read because you're so into climate. Mm, thanks. Let's see, David Attenborough, great man. He's talking about climate change, both ocean and land and the Amazon, and it's a great book. Also, I'm a backpacker, backpacked with my son in Evolution Valley, and I got from your from your discussion that you've been there to Evolution Valley, uh, part of the John Muir Trail up to Muir Pass. Have you been there? Oh, yeah. It's that's my favorite. Beautiful. It's, it's very lovely. Yeah, and my son's a big backpacker. He was out for 43 days all along the trail, all the way to Yosemite. He's gone north, so you would relate to him. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a really long trip. And I was privileged to be one of the first in the museum when the show opened. So I actually saw your exhibit and it was beautiful. Oh, cool. I loved it. <laughs> so I hope to get there myself sometime. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, the first time I did the Muir Trail, it was in 82 and people were starting at Mount Whitney and going up to Yosemite. And these yeah. days people start at Yosemite and go down to Mount Whitney. I guess yeah. it's thought of to be easier north to south and because you aren't climbing to 14,000 feet the first day. And have you ever, ever gone from west to east? Like um, the Paiute Pass trail goes over to the east side. And there yeah. are a number of different trails that go that way. That's the great thing about the Sierra. There are endless trails. There's right. a lifetime of hiking. The sad thing, we had these fires. The Creek Fire was very devastating for that area. You probably know of Florence Lake and Edison Lake. That whole Yosemite, I mean, that whole basin of the South Fork of the San Joaquin River was decimated. So sad. Wow. Yeah. So the fires are part of the climate change. Yep. Yeah, I have a large piece about fire on my website. It's oh, um, do you? Oh, wow. called on the nature of fire, and it's kind of a flow chart about different uh, variables of fire ecology. Is it possible to show it here or not? Oh, I don't think so. I would okay. have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> it would take me another hour. But just go okay. to my website and, and it's okay. right there. <laughs> you might tell them what your website is. Oh, it's bonniepeterson.com. 
That's easy. <laughs> one word, small cap. Yeah. Bonnie, I want to say hi from St. Paul. I used to be neighbors with you and um, up in the UP. And I just, I've always marveled that you have such a gift for understanding all this difficult scientific stuff. It's kind of unusual, um, I think, for people who have a gift for um, shape and color and putting things together in a beautiful way. How do you explain that in you? <laughs> Being an artist and a science person, how do you do that? Well, I had a background in statistics in college and I did work in marketing research for a while. So I wasn't afraid of math or science, but that first, artist scientist project that University of Wisconsin had uh, 10 years ago, both the scientists were apprehensive and the artists were thinking they would be intimidated. But um, we broke those barriers and I had a lot of help explaining things, um, which is really why it's great to have a scientist who wants to communicate because sometimes I'll have to go back to them four or five times to ask extra questions. So if they aren't really dedicated to working with me, they can be overwhelmed by their own research and students and um, not have the time to answer little email questions that are kind of uh, esoteric and probably way beneath them. But I've had some really great scientists to work with and uh, some of them, like Valerie Truitt, I just emailed her out of the blue and she was excited. So um, some scientists are really happy. The permafrost guy, uh, I emailed him. I didn't hear back. I emailed all his colleagues. <laughs> Finally, I heard back and he's been really helpful too. But um, sometimes it's, uh, I have someone in mind that I really wanted to get help from. And um, it's good to have like the top person in the field, really, they can boil stuff down. They have tremendous visuals and um, lots of journal articles in their name. So I really enjoy that. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> Uh, I, Cynthia that asked the other question about the Anthropocene, am I saying that right? Uh, she said, what I meant was how, how is the concept displayed in the designs, colors, scales, etc." So I don't know oh. if you can explain that. Hmm. Is that a, a tough question? <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of my choice of colors has to do with uh, what I have used before that I do not want to repeat and make things a little more different um, from each other. And this uh, piece is going to be in a show with the permafrost pieces and uh, the insect piece that I showed at the Peggy Notabart uh, nature museum in October and I would just hate for everything to look similar so I try to make things as different and uh, visually interesting I didn't really choose this color as having to do with the Anthropocene I know the graph is red so that's significant with warming but um, other than that, I, I'm not, uh, I think the CO2 graph is iconic at this point. It's in a lot of artwork, probably. I know it's in a lot of my artwork and it goes up and down showing glacier, glacier um, ice ages through the ages, so. Uh, I didn't have anything to do with making that, <laughs> but um, 
I thought red was significant, so. Thank you. Oh, I also put a link in the chat for anyone that wants to. We have a uh, basically um, a gallery guide online that you can go visit all of the artworks in Bonnie's exhibition. And there's the link there in the chat. So if you wanna save that, you can. Uh, let's see, there is another question, a few more. Do you use an art agent? Uh, no. <laughs> um, be the answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know anything about that. I guess if there was one time when, uh, when um, I think it's Merrill Lynch or one of those, not Merrill Lynch, it was one of the big eight accounting firms built a building in downtown Chicago and they hired uh, Susan Blackburn, I think, or Black something. And she is an art agent and she placed artwork in every nook and cranny of that building uh, according to like a hundred pages of architectural drawings. So um, I guess that's the closest I would say, I, I, Susan Blackman, I think that's her name. Okay. Oh, and, and there, here's a plug for you, Cynthia Valoric, a plug for Bonnie, who is going to be on my panel at the upcoming College Art Association Conference. The title of the session is From Wheatfields to Oh, there's another word, escophy, echo Sophie. I can't say that one. A consideration of women artists in the history of climate change. So I'm, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> so I don't know those words, but it's also in the chat and it's spelled there. Well, that's wonderful. And thank you so much, Bonnie. We are so appreciative. We've enjoyed working with you and the exhibition will be on display through the end of this year. So. And, and one more question just popped up in the chat, if you don't mind. Uh, what advice might you offer to artists just starting out? Oh. I would say just keep making art, get on a schedule and do it every day as much as possible and uh, just get a practice going. And uh, the topics will come. Uh, I guess that's what I would say, just keep doing it and try to get a supportive group. I know Anne is a tremendous support for me up here Thank you so much, Bonnie. We do, as, as, to echo Sarah's words, we really appreciate your taking the time to, to be with us today. <laughs>